May I invite you to stand for the national anthem, please? Professor Archibald MacDonald, Pro-Vice-Chancellor and Principal of the University of the Western Ismona Campus. Mr. Eric Hussein, President of Guardian Life and Mrs. Karen Borasing, President of our sister company, Guardian General. Our esteemed guest lecturer, Dr. Robert Talbert. Senior administrators and members of staff of the university campus. Guardian Life Executives and Management Team, Educators, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming all to the UWI Guardian Life Premium Teaching Open Lecture 2015. It is delightful to see so many persons in attendance. Thank you all for being here. At this time, I invite Reverend Verna Castles, University Chaplain from the Uni United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands to give the invocation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you generously bless us with intellectual gifts, the ability to teach and to learn. Forgiving God, forgive us for our contentment at times to keep practicing the old ways and expecting improved results. Lord, we thank you for the collaborative effort of educational institution and business entities to the improvement of our society, especially for the co-sponsorship between the UE and Guardian Group for this premium teaching open lecture over these 11 years. And so, Lord, we thank you for the gifts blessed to our lecturer, Dr. Robert Talbert. And we pray, Lord, that as he imparts this knowledge, 21st century technology, serving 21st century learners, that those of us who are here will not only receive it intellectually, but will receive it and seek to pass it on. So into your hands we present this time. We pray for a special blessing on him as he imparts this knowledge. And we pray for your strength to carry through as we seek to educate others. We pray this in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and let God's people say, Amen and Amen. At this time, I wish to extend apologies on behalf of the following persons who are unavoidably absent. Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, and Dr. Damian King, head 
Department of Economics. This evening, Guardian Life is reinforcing its commitment to education by once again partnering with the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, to host the premium teaching open lecture. This event is organized through the Joint Working Committee of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning here at UWE and Guardian Life. This cooperation seeks to highlight, promote, and support teaching excellence by university lecturers, while at the same time promoting outreach to the general population with respect to education. We aim to engage you for the next hour and a half as we move through this evening's program. So please stay with us, mind, body, and soul, as we ask for your undivided attention. At this time, it is my pleasure to invite Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, Professor Archibald MacDonald, to bring greetings on behalf of the university. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Professor MacDonald. Um, thank you, Mrs. Foster, uh, Mr. Eric Hosin, President of Guardian Life, and also Ms. Bursing, Dr. Talbert, our guest lecturer, Reverend Castles, our own university chaplain, deans, members of the UWI executive management team, and other UWI colleagues, um, staff of Guardian Life Limited, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. The chairperson already extended an apology on behalf of Vice Chancellor Sir Hilary Beckles, but um, let me assure you that he asked me to extend apologies on his behalf and to explain that he really is very sorry um, for his absence, but he has another engagement, unfortunately. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the 2015 Guardian Life Teaching Lecture. This evening's lecture, as you heard, will be delivered by the distinguished Dr. Robert Talbert and is entitled 21st Century Technology Serving 21st Century Learners. It highlights a significant theme that has been adopted by the University of the West Indies as it continues to chart new pathways in tertiary education. As we increasingly become a society defined by technology, we must begin to incorporate new technological learning practices into our teaching infrastructure in order to meet the evolving needs of a 21st century student. The utilization of technology in education has made significant strides since the turn of the 21st century, so much so that we can now view it as an integral facet to the overall learning experience. Today's academic experience employs the use of smart boards to teach, tablets to read, PCs to prepare and distribute documents, and the World Wide Web to gain knowledge, rather to gather information and explore issues and concepts globally. Technology has certainly become an integral part of our daily lives, and it is therefore fitting that as a leading tertiary institution that we begin to incorporate this function into our teaching practices. I therefore am delighted to welcome Dr. Robert Talbert to the university and to thank him for agreeing to present at today's lecture. 
Dr. Talbert's research and work focuses on the use of technology to support active learning. And as such, he, he will be able to offer useful insights into this dynamic approach to learning. As a regional institution, it is important that we learn and embrace new concepts from our international neighbors. Information sharing between universities and countries is a key to ensuring that we remain relevant and up to date with the new strides being taken in higher education. And this evening's lecture is testimony to our commitment to this global transfer of knowledge. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning for, arran for arranging yet another significant lecture. I would also like to extend uh, the university's sincere gratitude to Guardian Life for its continued support of the center in its mission to enhancing the teaching and learning experience of our UWI students. Sir, you and your, col and your colleagues, your partnership with the center has had an undeniable impact on the enhancement of the academic experience at the university. And for that, the university thanks you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you all for joining us. And I hope that you will enjoy the rest of the evening and that Dr. Talbert's lecture provides you with greater insight into the new dimension of 21st century learning. Thank you. Do enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much, Professor MacDonald. We are aware of the many demands on your time, and so we're really, appreci we're really appreciative of your being here with us this evening. Uh, there is another apology that has come in. Dr. Winston Adams, the president of the University College of the Caribbean, has sent his apology. He is unavoidably absent, but he has asked his representative, Dr. Paul Thompson, to be here. So we thank you, Dr. Thompson. I now call on our president, that is Guardian Life's president, Eric Hosin, to give his address. Um, Madam Chair, Mrs. Alicia Foster, Vice President of Guardian Life, Professor Archibald MacDonald, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, our esteemed guest lecturer, Dr. Robert Talbert, Senior Administrators and Member Staff of the University Campus, Guardian Life Executives and Management Team, Staff of Guardian Life and Staff of the University, Reverend Werner Cassels, University Chaplain, Lecturers, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good evening. No man, I don't know, is it, Prof, prof is it that at university you keep quiet because you're in class? Good evening. Good evening. All right. <laughs> so the Prof has given you permission to say, to speak up, speak up. It is always a pleasure to be here in this forum for yet another collaborative effort between Guardian Life and the University of the West Indies, Mona in hosting this premium teaching open lecture. At Guardian Life, education is of paramount importance and one of the main focuses of our corporate social responsibility program. Hence, our continued partnership with the University of the West Indies. Although I must tell you that sometimes I'm a little nervous coming up here. Um, at one of the lectures, it costs the company about $5 million as uh, the previous principal was able to bend my arm and get us to put some money into something that, you know. <laughs> so I'm glad that um, I am being separated from him. <laughs> the University Garden Group Premium Teaching Lecture was introduced to the UWI Mona campus in 2004 after successful implementation 
of the premium teaching award at the UWI St. Augustine campus in 1998. Seeing the value of the partnership, Garden Life jumped on board and gave our full support to the initiative here in Jamaica. A memorandum of understanding was later signed between Garden Life and the UWI Mona for plans to be put in place and the subsequent 12 years led to the introduction of the first premium teaching open lecture series after which a trend has developed to alternate between the Distinguished Lecture and the Premium Teaching Excellence Award. Irish poet William Butler Yeats once expressed, education is not the filling of the pail, but the lighting of the fire. We are proud to be continuing in a positive way to the lighting of the fire, to be a part of the teaching learning process, which is profoundly important here at UWE and in our nation. To you teachers who are vessels of knowledge, the work you do on a daily basis cannot and should not be discounted. Good teacher is like a candle. It consumes itself to light the way for others. Continue to ignite, my friends, the passion of learning within your students as the reward will be great. We take pride in being a part of the planned planning and execution of this process, and we look forward to hearing from Robert, Dr. Robert Talbert. Uh, you may have heard that he's from, yeah, you read that he's from Michigan, but really, he's really originally from Indiana. So those who are NFL fans, he, he has Colts blood, even though he's close to Detroit Lions and Green Bay Packers. But, you know, it's in his blood, Colts. Um, the Premium Teaching Excellence Award and Open Series has added significant value to the educators and students at the university. Over the past 12 years, the knowledge and insights gained from the various lecturers, professors, and guest speakers who have graced these very halls are invaluable to the university community. Commendation to UWI Mono for its unwavering dedication to finding innovative ways of raising standards of teaching and for producing some of the region's most qualified professionals. This year, we at Garden Life, we have invested over $4 million in scholarships during, you know, for GSAT students, tertiary level students, and we look forward to continuing doing this in terms of helping education. The university undoubtedly is a boiling pot of greatness. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will greatly benefit from this lecture and thank you very much for coming and we thank the university for partnering with us or for allowing us to partner with them <laughs> in this venture each and every year. God's blessings to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Eric. We can always depend on you to be short and add a little bit of humor. So we are now approaching the highlight of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, and that's the presentation from our guest lecturer. I now call on Mrs. Juven Montague Anderson, Manager, Integrated Marketing Communications at Guardian Life, and a member of the planning committee to introduce the guest lecturer. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinguished pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Robert Talbert, this evening. Dr. Robert Talbert is an associate professor in the mathematics department at Grand Valley State University, Allendale, Michigan, USA. He previously, he taught at Franklin College, Indiana for 10 years, where he was also an associate professor and prior to that at Bethel College, where he was an assistant professor of mathematics. Dr. Talbert holds a PhD in mathematics from Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, specializing in algebraic topology and homological algebra. His interest in mathematics includes category theory, cryptography, and computer science. As an associate professor at Grand Valley State University, he teaches courses for mathematics majors, pre-service mathematics instructors, 
engineers, and computer scientists. He is also the coordinator of the mathematics department's seminar series and manages the educational technology acquisitions for the department. Dr. Talbert's strong interest in mathematics pedagogy is clearly demonstrated in his thoroughgoing understanding of and worked with the inverted or flipped classroom where he uses technology to support active learning environments in the STEM disciplines, particularly through the use of pair instruction, screencasting, classroom response systems, and the fusion of mathematics and computer programming. In addition to his professional responsibilities as an associate professor of mathematics, Dr. Talbert serves as a keynote speaker consultant, and workshop facilitator. He has served in these capacities with a variety of audiences, but generally the focus is on teaching and learning, especially in relation to mathematics education at the college and university levels. Over the years, he has developed significant expertise in the use of the flipped classroom to facilitate the teaching and learning of mathematics and the integration of technology to advance teaching and learning in mathematics. Dr. Talbert is an avid blogger and has been blogging for the Chronicle of Higher Education since 2011. His research and writing projects have been mainly concerned with the scholarship of teaching and learning, particularly on flipped learning and the integration of technology in university mathematics courses. Dr. Talbert is married with three children and enjoys spending his leisure time with his family. Ladies and gentlemen, help me, make, help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Talbert. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for that warm welcome. It's been a warm welcome all across the board since I arrived in Jamaica for the first time uh, yesterday afternoon. It feels like it's been longer than that. Uh, we've had a very busy day and we'll have some tomorrow. Um, I want to thank the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, and Guarding Group uh, in particular for inviting me to come and speak with you and work with you uh, over the course of the next few days. It's been a real pleasure to be with you here in this beautiful country. Um, and it's my first time to Jamaica, as I said, and I'm eager to get to know you more and to get to know your country more uh, uh, as uh, we, uh, we, uh, we spend time together. The first rule of technology use is you have to have a non-technology backup, and you have to have a plan B, C, D, E, all the way through Z, just in case, because you know what will happen at the worst possible moment. And as I tell my students, um, friendship and communication trump technological issues every single time. <laughs> so if we have an issue, we work it out together. So I wanted to give you a little bit of context as we begin about myself and my working environment. Uh, I, as uh, you've heard, I'm a professor in the mathematics department at Grand Valley State University in the state of Michigan. You can see they're pointing uh, the arrow pointing to it right on the shore of Lake Michigan. Um, this is a state-sponsored university of around 26,000 students. Uh, if you just look at where our two institutions are located, UWI and Grand Valley State, and by the way, the picture there on the right is what it actually looks like on campus right now with fall foliage, and it's quite a, quite a climate shock to come from there to here. Uh, if you just look at where our institutions are located on the map, uh, you might not guess there is much similarity between our two institutions. For example, uh, here is a picture of Kingston, Jamaica in January. Apparently, this is someone's driveway. Uh, and by contrast, this is a picture of my driveway in, uh, in January uh, with the snow. That's, that's actually a small amount of snow. Because we are next to Lake Michigan, we typically get about 100 inches of snow a year. So uh, slightly dissimilar. Uh, UWI has a fantastic cricket team. Uh, Grand Valley State has no cricket team. Uh, but we do have a Quidditch team. For those of you who are interested in the Harry Potter uh, books, we do have an actual muggle Quidditch team. So that's a, I'll explain later if you would like for me to do that. <laughs> so um, it might seem on the surface that our two institutions do not have much in common, but in fact, the more research that I did on UWI, uh, I think we have 
more than meets the eye in common. For example, UWI, founded in 1948, uh, currently serving around 36,000 students when you put together the four campuses, including the open campus, uh, serving the West Indies and the entire Caribbean region. Grand Valley State, founded in 1960, 26,000 students on three campuses, and it serves West Michigan and the Midwestern United States. So uh, some similarities there. And the more that I read the literature on your website about your, um, your goals, your, what you hope for your students, your dreams for your students, and compared them with what's on in our minds in Grand Valley, I found some similarities as well. So some of the key attributes that we both desire from our graduates are we would like our graduates to be critical and creative thinkers, effective communicators, we would like for them to be innovative, entrepreneurial, globally aware, culturally competent, able to work with diverse audiences. And perhaps most especially, one of the words that we, or phrases we use a lot at Grand Valley is the concept of being a lifelong learner. We really hope that our students, above all else, if nothing else happens, uh, have both the taste and the ability to learn new things over the course of their entire lives, or else I really doubt whether they've become educated to be honest. Um, so our institutions, I think, have some remarkable similarities, similar makeups, missions, values. We seem to want the same things for our students, and we seem to value excellent academic preparation and excellent teaching as a primary mission of our institutions. And first and foremost, we both value the lives of our students as human beings with unique skills and backgrounds who can contribute something amazing to the world. And above all, the most striking similarity that I find between our institutions is the one that we sometimes miss because it's so obvious, and that is simply the world into which our graduates are going to enter. I'm not referring to necessarily the place where they live or the place where they get jobs, but just simply the world that contains it, uh, which contains their work and shapes their life and their work. So our students are faced with this world, and it's a world that needs their talents and needs their skills. And yet, it's also a world that never really seems to stay still for very long. It's a world that is fraught with uncertainty, a world in which the problems that our students today will be asked to solve, those problems do not yet exist. So in the rest of my talk this evening, uh, what I'd like to highlight is the nature of this world into which our students are going to be entering, specifically how higher education can prepare students for this world and the role of 21st century technology in assisting in this preparation. In particular, I'd like to address the following issues that are of common concern to us. First of all, the students themselves, the learners of the 21st century. They are the heart and soul of what we are doing. Uh, both here in Mona and back home in Allendale. What are their needs? What are the challenges that they face? What are the demands that are being placed upon them? And also, what are the unique attributes and resources that they bring to the problems that are so difficult to the world? I also like to address 21st century higher education, the system into which they come when they see us. Here in 2015, what does a university education look like? What should it look like? Does it actually serve well the needs of our students, address the challenges they have to face, and tap into the resources and the characteristics of the learners who are in our care? And finally, I'd like to talk about what higher education in the 21st century could look like and how technology, especially what we're going to call 21st century technology, can be leveraged to meet the needs of our students and prepare them to make that impact that they are capable of making. So let's begin by talking about the learners themselves. So the students that we have today are entering into this world I've described that is changing at an increasingly rapid pace. Uh, I promise there will not be much mathematics in this talk, but I will bring out one, uh, yes, I will bring out one term that we in calculus talk about, an increasing concave up function. <laughs> it looks like this. That's the kind of world, the kind of change that students are going to experience, that we ourselves are experiencing, steep and getting steeper as it proceeds. So the students we are entering in, that we have, are entering into the world, but they are also a product of this world, and they understand it perhaps a little better than some of us do. 
So to give some insights on these learners and also to get us talking with each other a little bit, I'd like to give you an exercise that I give to my students on the first day of every semester. And here's how this exercise is gonna go. This exercise consists of four questions, although to keep it a little shorter on time, I'm gonna cut it down to three questions. They are not mathematics questions, although mathematics might come up in their answers to these things. Uh, so um, there is no math involved, like I said. So I want you to participate in the, this activity the same way I ask my students to participate, and that's as follows. I'm gonna put each of the questions one at a time up on the screen. When you see the question, I just want you to think to yourself without talking to anyone uh, about what you think the answer is. Maybe jot it down if you would like to. Uh, but don't talk to anyone else yet. And then after a few moments have passed, I will have you talk to each other about this and compare notes, and then maybe we can share as a large group. So three important questions. First question is, what is the purpose of a university education? So what I'd like you to do is think about this quietly for just a few moments. Those moments seem incredibly long when it's quiet. Okay, and that's, that's probably possibly enough. Uh, it's a question we could spend our whole lives answering, but now I'd like you to turn to your neighbors and discuss what you said. What do you think is the purpose of a university education? I'll give you two minutes to do that. Okay, that's probably good for now, right? <laughs> this is a very deep question. It's, a, it's a quite a thing to drop this on a student in the first day of a mathematics class. Like, why aren't we talking about math? Uh, I'm very curious to hear what you, what you thought. Would anyone mind sharing? We're not gonna, not gonna say good or bad ideas at this point, just gonna collect some data. What is the purpose of a university education? They're in the back. To create thinkers. Create thinkers. Doers. Doers. Leaders. Leaders. Movers. Movers. Shakers. shakers, I knew that was coming next. <laughs> <laughs> All five of those at once. Okay, creating thinkers, doers, movers, leaders, and shakers. Is that, okay, did I get them all? Okay. What else? How does one create a leader? Yes. Problem solvers. Problem solvers, okay. Okay, creating problem solvers. Let's take one more. Yes. That's interesting. And operate in an environment with people from different backgrounds, a differing uh, objective. I like that very much. To learn how to live with other people, possibly an important skill, since unless you're going to be a hermit. Okay, there could be. <laughs> some people are. Um, keep thinking about that question, but I have another one for you, and that is, how does a person learn new things? Okay. This is the second question I give to my students after we've talked about what's the purpose of a university education. How does a person learn new things? Please take one minute to think quietly about that. My students can't keep quiet when they think about these things, so I won't call you out if you have to surreptitiously talk to someone. How does a person learn new things? Okay, now turn to your neighbor and discuss what your answer was. How do you think a person learns new things? How do you learn new things? And we'll take a couple of minutes to interact with each other. <clears throat> Take just a few more moments. How does a person learn new things? Uh, 
Okay, let's hear from you. Um, how does a person learn new things? Yes, over here. Okay. Okay. Reading, observing, interacting with others, and doing. Okay. Who else? Experience. Experience. Okay, which is a sort of a combination of all the things that she said. And then one more back here. <laughs> okay. Research doing. Okay, which is a kind of experience which involves doing. Okay. Yes. I see, by making oneself, okay, that's true, that's true, unlearning is an important part of learning. Right, yes. One other thing, you know, uh, the, the presenter, if you are in a room, uh, you will learn new things based on how it is communicated to you as well. Because okay. you could come into a room where you have no interest or you think you have no interest in what is being presented, but the methodology that is used and how it is presented will help you to learn things. Yeah, so the, the, if you didn't hear that, it's the, method, the methodology that makes a person ready to learn and interest in learning. Motivation is, is, is very key, yes. There could be a lot more to say about that, but I have one final question for you, and this one is really hard. Okay, and it's not mathematics, although there's a number involved in it. And it is, take a deep breath, what do you reasonably expect to remember from your coursework 10 years from now? We call this the 10-year question, okay? So put yourself in the shoes of a student, or perhaps you are a student, um, and think about this question. What do you, re not what would you like to remember 10 years from now, what do you reasonably expect to remember given everything you know about yourself and how human learning works, et cetera, et cetera, uh, 10 years from now, 2025, one quarter of the way through the 21st century? <laughs> this is a hard question, no doubt. Okay, turn to each other and share what you what you said. What any any answer is okay here. Okay, let's jump straight to the uh, the sharing part here. Okay, so what do you what do you say? How much of your coursework do you possibly remember if it was ten years ago, or if you're if you're a student, what's your answer to this? Yes. In the back there. I think I tend to remember things that I created. Mm. And try to do different. Okay, things you create and do differently. Okay, so how much? How, what? What? Or I actually didn't say how much. I said what do you reasonably expect to remember? Okay, yeah. Yes. I'm using myself as an example. Because you are a student. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, that was a that was a bad mistake. Seven years ago, from the university, and not necessarily a percent, but I believe that students will remember the core principles. Applies to their life or their career. Path. Applies to them, okay. Yes. So, core principles, I believe. Core principles of what connects with you, yes. yes, which is different than the core principles of a discipline, possibly. Yeah, can be, there can be a difference. It's related. Yeah. It's related because if your field of study after you leave the university, if you go into the field of study that you, that you learned, then you will remember the core principles that apply to what you're doing. Okay. One more, and that'll be the last word before I tell you what my students typically say on this. Okay, nobody wants to say anything. <laughs> okay, well, let me tell you what my students typically say to this when it's the first day of class. Um, there is very little variation in the responses that I get from class to class to class, whether it's seniors, whether it's freshmen, whether it's advanced coursework, whether it's remedial coursework. It's the same thing every time. And it's not because I have the same students every time either, though there is some overlap. Here's what they say to these three questions. Okay, first of all, to the first question of what is the purpose of a university education? Of course, the first thing they say it's what? To prepare me for a job. Okay, but then I push back on this. I say, well, what does it mean to be prepared for a job? Okay, is it just having content knowledge? 
and they say, well, you, have, you need some content knowledge. But then I say, but everybody else who's competing for that job also has content knowledge. They're also good. So what makes you so special? What makes you competitive for that position? And then when I press them on this, they say that to really be prepared for a job in a competitive sense, you have to have some content knowledge, <laughs> not necessarily all of it down. Uh, but really, to be competitive, you also have to know how to solve problems. We heard that from the group. Uh, work with other people. We heard that from the group. Use technology to get things done, whether that's something in your discipline or just something that you do at the office to get things done. And know how to learn new things quickly without having to have your hand held all the time. And employers echo this. There was a great study done in, of engineering firms in the United States. And, you know, they, they were asked, uh, it was a focus group of CEOs and CTOs from, uh, from engineering firms, and they were just simply asked, you know, what do you expect out of college graduates in engineering, one directly out of school, one year out of school, five years out of school? And they wanted people who they didn't have to move them along so much, that they were self-starters. That's the number one thing that they wanted, interestingly enough. And more than a few of these students will say that the purpose of a university education is to learn how to learn over the entire course of your life. That is unprompted. <laughs> they, know, they don't know that I want to hear this, <laughs> but I really do want to hear this. And they know that once they leave the university, there is no more lecturing. There is no more coursework. You, you are on your own, and you have to learn what you need to learn. And there's not necessarily going to be a professor there on your shoulder telling you what you need to know and whether you are right or not. The next question, how does a person learn new things? Unerringly, they say it's by doing things. By doing things. By getting some initial guidance, perhaps, on, in a new subject to get oriented and get some perspective. Uh, but overwhelmingly, you learn things by trial and error, practice and failure, through uh, guidance, uh, and to use a computer science term, by writing the program and then having to debug it because it doesn't compile. <laughs> I teach a lot of computer science majors, and that's a, that's a metaphor. So very rarely, if I ask them, if I change that question to, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so m more than a few of them will say this. Okay. As for the last question, the 10-year question, um, students say they will expect to remember some of their coursework 10 years from now if they have a job that uses it. But overwhelmingly, if I push them on this and I change that to a how much do you expect, you give it to me as a percentage, they'll say, if I'm optimistic, 20%. 80, the other 80% is just going to be gone with the wind, uh, um, yeah, e even if there is a job that uses it. Then no job is going to use every single instance of their coursework. So uh, otherwise, they expect to remember basically nothing <laughs> in terms of content, in terms of content. But what uh, someone over there said, they readily say that they will remember experiences, uh, particularly experiences that involve what we call productive failure, okay? Failing at something and then making it right for the rest of their lives. And they can pick specific instances when they were, say, six years old where they encountered this. I often follow this up with the question of, tell me about the most important things that you have ever learned in your life, like all the way back to when you are an infant. Okay, like speaking your native language, learning how to eat with a fork, <laughs> that level of thing. How did you learn those things? You must have had a great lecturer on how to eat with a fork. Now, overwhelmingly, it was because you know, I had some guidance at first. You know, mom and dad helped me out, but eventually I had to figure this out myself. And there was a lot of error in that, in that process. But somehow we figured it out because we are human beings. And that's what we're wired to do is figure things out. So these are the learners that we have. Okay? They are perfectly aware that the world is changing at an accelerating pace, and therefore retaining lots of content knowledge is just simply a lost cause. And therefore, an education that's predicated on just merely the coverage and retention of, of content knowledge is just totally irrelevant to them. So what are their needs? What are the needs of the students that we have today? Well, first of all, an overwhelming need to just simply find a place in the world. Um, uh, to contribute to the world and to make a life for themselves. So this typically involves work experiences, but not necessarily and not exclusively. It also involves family, relationships, lifelong growth, both in and out of their fields. Uh, in both their work and their lives, these students need an education that helps them attain the life that they want. I think students come to us wanting a life, not necessarily an education.
an education insofar as it helps them attain the life that they want, put it that way. So what are their challenges? Well, the biggest challenge that students face is just simply the increasing rate of change, uh, first and foremost. The world that the 2016 graduates of UWI are going to enter into is going to be different and could be radically different than the October 2015 world that we're sitting in right now. We have no idea what could happen in the next six months to change the world completely. And there's a high probability, higher probability than there used to be that that something could actually happen. Uh, the students want to keep up, or will be challenged to keep up with their professions, be uh, active and informed citizens, caring and compassionate friends and family and community members in this world. And their education needs to address this. Now on the other hand, or not on the other hand, but going along with this, students have a lot going for them today. Uh, this, this generation of students gives me great optimism. First and foremost, uh, I think students today are just good people. I, I find them to be kind, considerate, uh, interesting, they have unique backstories, they have great experiences, they have strong struggles too and, and battles that they're fighting that we often don't even know because we don't ask or don't look. They care about the world that they live in. I found that especially true here in Jamaica just in my short time. They're genuinely curious, highly industrious and willing to engage with ideas and people if they are convinced of the relevance of their engagement. <laughs> There's the catch, isn't it? Now, on the other hand, uh, they have absolutely no patience whatsoever for anything that is irrelevant to them. Okay, I'm counting that as something in their favor, notice. Okay, now what could be possibly favorable about not caring about something that's irrelevant to you? I think students today have a great ability to cut through the fluff of things and see right to the heart of the issue. And they do not necessarily put up with a lot of nonsense. And I think that can be a great strength if it can be leveraged. Uh, many of them are quite facile with technology. I was standing around today and I'm just counting the number of cell phones that, was, that were in use by students sitting around. Um, almost all of them have grown up around technology, if not facile with it. And so this is not an alien concept to them to use technology to get things done. And they have a way of being un unorthodox in their thinking. And I think that can be a strong point in their favor. Um, we, we, we create cookie cutter students to our danger, I believe. And so students, uh, their very impatience with things that could be irrelevant often works in their favor to become the kind of creative and out of the box thinkers that we really need. So these are the people that we are working with. Uh, we know their needs, their challenges, and their resources. So now let's turn and look at the system of higher education that we're providing to them. And I wanna just back up a little bit and say something about it from recent history. The September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks in the United States changed the face of my country in ways that are just too numerous to count. And in many ways, we Americans are still sorting out the implications of this event, and we're trying to figure out how to have a free country in the world today, um, with varying degrees of success, I might add. And not only did the 9-11 attacks change government and civic life, uh, it also changed higher education, interestingly, and it did so in a way that you don't often hear in the news. So shortly after the 9-11 attacks, and partially as a response to them, uh, a group of engineering educators uh, got together and realized that the world in which we live had been changed utterly and was changing rapidly. And this called for a serious reconsideration of the way that engineers are trained to work in, how to, in, in the world. So they began work on a document that was eventually released in 2004 called The Engineer of 2020, Visions of Engineering in the New Century. So uh, also sometimes just called Engineer 2020. So the impetus behind Engineer 2020 was a realization that the previous model of engineering education, which is to build an engineering degree program based purely on content knowledge and then adding in coursework and new curricula in response to the demonstrated needs of society is untenable in a world as changing, that's changing as fast as it does. Whereas in the past, it would have been okay to let engineering training lag the, in the technological and social change happening in the world, and then design curricula in a sort of a reactive way. The world had changed, and the pace of technological and social and political change was accelerating to the point where any lag at all would render the entire discipline of engineering irrelevant. Instead, engineering, they decided, needed to be changed itself so that it takes a proactive rather than a reactive stance, not asking what are the needs of society and then retrofitting the engineering program to that, but rather saying what needs might be coming down the road that we haven't even considered yet, and then training engineers to think like engineers for problems that haven't 
come over the horizon yet. Terrorism was one of those main problems. We have no idea what the next terrorist threat is going to look like, and our engineers need to be ready for it, whatever it is. So I think the engineers got it right on this. Um, the, 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 the way that the world is changing and the pace at which it's changing calls for a more proactive rather than reactive stance to equip people with general intellectual skills and technological skills, and we're coming to that in a minute, uh, that'll allow you to adapt to things that haven't actually even happened yet. So we might ask in this context a lot of questions about change. Is change really even necessary? I mean, after all, all of, Western, all of the Western Hemisphere, and UWI in particular, inherited a system of education from the United Kingdom that has been around for 850 years, and it's produced some of the greatest intellects and works in human history. Is it really time to change it? What's so bad about it? <laughs> well, while we do wish to respect our traditions, I would suggest that in this moment, here in 2015, higher education is facing an unprecedented need to take what's best about its traditions and modernize them, to match the needs and challenges of its stakeholders, particularly the needs of students, and to situate itself in this rapidly changing world I've described. I just want to mention one aspect of this need for change, and that's how we faculty conceive of our pedagogy, the way that we design and manage our classes and teach our students. So in the US, at least, uh, the design and, introduction of and instruction of courses is predominantly centered on the traditional lecture format, as you see sort of depicted here. Students come to class in this format. You know what it is, because we all had it. Uh, they come to class, they sit. Uh, they listen to a lecture in which information is being disseminated like it is now, and then go to their personal spaces, wherever that may be, their dorm room, their apartment, houses, and then work on that information uh, through exercises, homework, writing, projects, and so on. And this is the way it has been for hundreds of years. But there's evidence now that from the scientific research on teaching and learning that there are better ways to teach and learn. Now, there's a quickly growing number of studies over the last 10 to 15 years done in a scientific methodology that have begun to shed light on the limitations of the lecture method of instruction, but none more so than this paper from 2014 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS, uh, Active Learning Increases Student Performance in Science, Engineering, and Mathematics. So this, uh, and this is freely available online, just Google PNAS Active Learning, and you can get the full PDF. It's only 10 pages long, it's a very quick read, and I urge every person in this room to do this over the weekend, okay? At least read the results and the discussion section. <laughs> if you don't like the statistics, you can skip the middle. I did, <laughs> for, for a while. So some two very startling findings, perhaps startling, from this uh, study. This is no slouch of methodology. This is a meta-analysis of 225 separate studies uh, on active learning in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM disciplines, uh, versus, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, versus lecture-based courses. By active learning, by the way, uh, we're, referring, we're referring to a large and diverse collection of teaching and learning strategies that just somehow involve the student at a core way in the learning process. This could range from something as simple and, and inexpensive to do as the think-pair-share exercise I had you do a few minutes ago. That was active learning. Uh, all the way to full-blown methodologies where the students run every aspect of the class, including the assessment. Yeah. Um, now, this PNAS study found two important things. First of all, students in lecture courses were 55% more likely to fail the course that they're in than students who are in their counterparts in active learning focused courses. 55% more likely. And then coming to exams, um, students in active learning courses scored about half a standard deviation higher on exams than students in lecture courses. In the United States, we, we typically grade courses on an A, B, C, D, F scale. I don't know how that compares to, to your system. Same, okay, so this is like the difference between possibly a B and a C, possibly an entire letter grade, okay? Or a passing and a failing grade, if you wanna really put, put uh, bring it to the point, okay? Uh, the, 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 the implications of these two findings are huge. And I just want to put it in the words of the authors of the study. If the experiments analyzed in this paper have been conducted as randomized controlled trials of medical interventions, they may have been stopped for benefit, meaning that the enrolling patients in the control condition would be discontinued because the treatment being tested was clearly more beneficial. It's as if you're a doctor and you're testing a new pharmaceutical 
You have sick people, you're giving them a placebo versus a treatment effect. And the treatment effect is so strong, it's so beneficial for so many people that it is unethical to withhold it anymore. Get it out to as many people as possible as fast as possible. We're just going to stop the test right now and get it out there. That's the kind of finding that these folks found about active learning techniques in the classroom. Now, I think that has strong implications for how we design our classes, don't you? So what's the upshot <laughs> from this, uh, this, this finding? And they go on to, to say a few more things about how many millions of dollars uh, in tuition money might have been saved from students who might have passed their courses if they had the right kind of instruction. So the upshot from this is that lecture as a tool, as, a, as, a, as an instruction method you sometimes adopt in the right times, in the right places, in the right context, can still be very effective. I mean, we pay money to go see good lectures sometimes, don't we? I do. Uh, but as a design paradigm for our courses, um, not only is it inferior to active learning, but it can actually be construed as actively harmful to students, and in fact, one of the findings uh, in some of the studies that they that meta-analyzed was that the students uh, who are most harmed by it are the students who are the most vulnerable. Uh, women, ethnic minorities, first-generation college students, uh, students from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. These are the folks that perform the worst in a lecture environment, <laughs> and they have the strongest gains in an active learning environment. So it's really time for us to have a gut check in higher education, as we say in the US sometimes, to look at the evidence